acted this way over the past 70 years. Uh, it's, rather than just putting in a nonfiction book by itself that, you know, the CIA really does investigate this stuff. Look, we caught you. We got a document. Or uh, the DOD really is building stuff. Look, we caught you. We have it on video. And they put that. It, it's bigger than that because uh, someone's got to got to present the arguments and the discussions and the fear and why they did certain things during that time. Um, you know, there's a part in Chasing Shadows where one of the characters wakes up and uh, in an abduction scenario and finds out they're really just wearing costumes. That really happened. And then you gotta ask yourself why. You know, the only way we can get to the why is by putting it out in a fictional story. When I wrote the outline of the section, and you read it, and, and you called me, and you're like, when you started to read about it, taking up on the ship, and there were all these alien things around you, you're like, oh my god, he's not going there. And yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember. <laughs> and it turns out. I was so happy. <laughs> and, 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 and the thing is, it's in a nonfiction book, they would say, someone found themselves in an abduction, and their name's so and so, and it was 1962, and they noticed a zipper on one of the aliens or something and that would be the end of it in the novel we can get to a conversation that says we have to fake an abduction because of this reason well what do you mean this reason because these are the stakes well they don't have to do we don't have to lie to people we have to lie to people you have to see those conversations to know why they ended up wearing costumes and, and, and doing that to people um, and it's not some nefarious purpose, you know, so... And, and it's not a binary, right? The, it, if there's a zipper, it doesn't necessarily mean that everything is explained. That's for sure. And, we're never, and we early on were saying, you know, we, we, we're specifically not trying to answer every question in the first book. And, and there's no way we can give you all the answers in the first nonfiction book. It's just too big. Because it does reach back to all the ancient civilizations and all the ancient religions and all that stuff. It, 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 it's all connected. So, um, from Dave, why the long, slow release of information? Why wait years? Now, I'm assuming that question is maybe for us because I've talked about how many years it, it, it's going to take to do this. Um, but I think it's more a better question in, this, in the terms of the government. You know, what do you think about the drip, 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 and why do you think they would do that? Well, it's it's a form of trying to manage the message and manage the information. And every time you have changes in administrations and things, there's a different approach, there's different priorities given. This, there's different approaches, different priorities given. Uh, I think the slow drip, drip, drip is because, um, in the first place, let's not assume that government is all knowing. I mean, they're trying to get there. But let's not assume that they are at this point. There's going to be things they don't understand themselves properly. And so they're going to be very cautious about releasing some information. They're going to use selected channels to do it. They're going to judge and see what the reaction is before they release any more. It's going to be a managed message. And I think that's why it's a slow drip of information. And you got to think of these institutions in the government are like, it's like Apple. You know, Apple, think about Apple, the biggest company in the world, is like this four or five hundred billion dollar company. And when they release the iPhone, they come up with marketing plans, they plan it out for years, they stress test all their decisions, and they roll it out hopefully exactly how they plan for however many years with how much money. The DOD is how many, like trillions big? <laughs> they're not three or four hundred million or billion, they're, they're trillions uh, at this point. So they have money, they have people from Yale, they have, uh, you know, physicists that you've never heard of that probably won you know, all the Nobel Prizes they could win, you know, they, they, they know what they're doing. Um, sometimes we, we catch them doing the bad stuff and then we just go, oh, they're so dumb, but they're not dumb. They're not dumb. And I, um, all the ones I met are some of the smartest people I've ever met in my life, biggest patriots, and, um, and conservative for really good reasons. So uh, it, it just, it makes a lot of sense once you start to learn why. And once again, having you develop that throughout a fictional story is going to work really great because when you get to the nonfiction, you find out that they went around and wore costumes you know just as an analogy it's like you're going to start to understand why also in terms of why it takes so long to reveal these it takes a really long time to write these books <laughs> yeah that is that could that could be it too i remember when i taught I was like 
we gotta go big. We gotta go like 700 pages. And he's like, seriously? Like, yeah. <laughs> we, we could fucking, we're gonna do like 8,000 pages. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, from Michelle, is your ultimate goal to prove aliens and UFOs exist? That's the wrong way to frame it for me. Um, that's a hard one. Because uh, it's like Peter said, uh, there, there's a consciousness component. Okay, so I'm I'm pretty. There's there's a there's a very specific way. Um, this is going to be framed for you guys in, in the world uh, in the coming years. That is understandable, but there is an element that is unknown that is really tricky with this stuff. There's really smart people in very secretive places debating if the whole thing is theater to prepare us for the universe at large, or this whole thing is some type of um, farm. Could be for energy, it could be for resources of other nature, it could be whatever. Um, there's also really smart people in secret places that are saying, well, is this where consciousness and quantum mechanics cross over? Or do our brains have the capacity to create these things in the sky uh, by by making matter develop? Because it's like it's like when the Native Americans would would do rain dancing, and they all concentrate and meditate together, and it rains. Well, uh, is that happening when we all just go, you know, bug-eyed green aliens? All of a sudden, they start to appear. They don't know on some of this stuff, but we do know that it it has the power to direct how mankind evolves over a very long period of time and potentially in cycles because when you look at the Giza pyramids and some of these other places there's there's some grand cycles that we're starting to discover with mankind we're kind of going okay maybe we're a little bit older than 3000 BC you know and uh, so it's not just about proving that UFOs and aliens exist it's about understanding uh, our potential because I'm under the belief at least by building it over time that our consciousness was tampered with in forms of religion in forms of um, deception so we don't discover the true power of humanity because we're a dangerous beast once we learn that telepathy is possible remote viewing is possible extrasensory perception is possible that you know I have a good friend whom you guys know uh, that sat at the table um, with a couple people and the guy bent the spoon in his hand. Bent it in his hand. He said, go in the kitchen and grab any, any silverware you want. And he walked out and they're at like this five-star dinner. It's uh, one of the people, I won't say the names, one of the people uh, is one of the richest men on the planet. The second person is one of the most uh, senior state officials in our country and also very, very wealthy. And then there was this magician. They just called him a magician. And at the end of the dinner, he goes, show me a trick. And he goes, okay, go in the kitchen and, and grab a piece of silver. And he does. And he goes, hold it in your hand. And he held it in his hand, and the guy looked at it, and it just bent in half. What the hell is that? You know? That's what humans can do. You know? And, uh, and to give you another example of that, Edgar Allan Mitchell, the sixth man to walk on the moon, he came back. And this guy, uh, was it was it Uri Geller, that was bending or milk, making the spoons melt in his hand? Well, Edgar Allan Mitchell was like, you know, I gotta figure out how he's doing that. He kind of found out that he might have been lying, there was some trick there, but all these kids were watching it on TV and they were doing it because they didn't know any better. So then he was like, he, had, he was like, oh my God, these he might be lying, but the kids don't know he's lying, so the kids are doing it. It's just a matter of belief, you know? So these were some of the, the things that I was saying when I met some very important people is like, by design, we're fighting each other and believing different things so we never unify and figure out that we're capable of these crazy things. Why? Well, you know, that's the whole point, right? So, next question. Sorry. Uh, from Ryan. What was the most challenging thing about writing Chasing Shadows? That's definitely a question for you. Uh, well, we talked some about the, the, the sort of the large-scale architecture of the thing. Um, I think, you know, because you've got multiple protagonists, uh, for me as a writer, you have to be able to get into the heads of the different characters, and who, whose background and experience are very different from my own, you know, and I knew that the very first scene was going to be a fighter pilot over Afghanistan, about which I know nothing, mm -hmm. um, and when you write a scene, you, you need to be able to sort of 
to know what it feels like to be in that cockpit and the controls and all the rest of it, you know. And, uh, and so that was challenging because I had to talk to a lot of people, I did a lot of, uh, do a lot of research just to sort of try to anchor, because you could just say, oh, he's flying over the desert, you know. And suddenly there's something exciting and I don't need to tell you about the cockpit because I know nothing about it. Um, but, you know, when you're in the story, you want to feel like you're really in the story, right? You want to feel like you're experiencing it the way the characters experience it. So that takes a lot of work and a lot of research. Um, and then the other big thing, as we were saying before, is that sort of large-scale architecture. How, how do you tell a story of this scale in ways that make it feel compelling and that you've got multiple characters that you're jumping around all over the place, but the whole thing still feels like a single story and people don't get too lost, and some people are going to get lost. And, um, but um, the, the, uh, the sense of trying to keep that story on the rails, coming at it from different perspectives, and then building to a single point. Um, this next question I get a lot, and I, I guess it has to, uh, has to be addressed, even though we've addressed it before. Uh, Peter, you've actually gone on uh, a couple websites and defended me on this question um, in a much more eloquent way <laughs> than, than, I, than I've done. Um, Katie asks, what do you have to say about people that claim that I'm a disin disinformation agent or just a mouthpiece for the government? And uh, it's, it's absurd, number one, because the government isn't just like one thing, you know? The government is like, it's almost like its own planet. It's so big. And that's part of the issue. Um, you know, there's not only one game in town when it comes to the subject. There's many, and uh, so to be to 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 think that I'm the mouthpiece of all of them combined is not only totally wrong, it but it is really absurd. But um, I think that's part of the problem. It's it's that everyone thinks the government knows all, that they have all this power, that uh, that. You know, they all speak together, work together, and have the same thought process. Uh, it's just not the way. I mean, many, you know, the intelligence community really doesn't get along with the military community, uh, and none of them get along with the politicians, and they're all just doing their own stuff. I mean, the military got sick of getting intelligence from the CIA, so they created their own intelligence service, they have the DIA, you know, and it's just like, and they're all finding things out, and they're all compiling this information. The way, the, the, the reason, I think people think that I am, because I'm the first guy to come out and say, oh my God, they might not be nuts. You know, oh my God, they might actually have our best intentions at heart. And I'm not talking about like, people kind of go, the government's bad. Look what they did at Vietnam or invading Iraq. I'm not talking about like, you know, the executive administration that makes a really bad decision and embarrasses our country and gets some young people killed. That's, that's icing on, a, on the cake. The real government, are the people that are career staff that don't make those decisions, but they're working on tough issues that last decades and decades. And uh, those are good people, and they don't uh, they 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 don't do things um, in the way that you would think. You know, we can all just say we can we, we can all like lump them all together and just think that they're they're you know it's all conspiratorial, but it's not. I think the issue with them was, and and I said this frankly to them. I go, you guys have. Uh, a communications deficiency. No one knows what you're doing, so they're defining it for you. They're going out on the internet and they're saying that you guys are out for yourselves, or it's all about the money, or we don't think we can handle it, like all this stuff. Uh, it's not the case. I tell people, you have to think about this subject matter uh, like a war. And that's why Peter's writing the book's called God's Man in War, because that's really what's going on. And it's like we're fighting ISIS. Now the government thinks you should know we're fighting ISIS, but they don't really think you should know that right now there's a special ops guy that might get beheaded and another guy comes in and shoots the guy in the face and all this blood everywhere and it's scary and people are dying. They don't need you to know that stuff. But they want you to know, look, we're fighting some bad dudes and, and we're dealing with it. And that's how the subject matter is. And they don't have the time to stop and go, oh my God, what does everyone think about it? They're just like, just don't let them know about it right now until we have a way to explain it. We're busy. We're just really fucking busy on this. And um, I knew that's what was going on, but I think that's what helped strike a nerve with different camps. And, uh, and that's why I've been so fortunate to be able to piece it together. But I think because I'm the first guy, 
that came to that conclusion, people just go, oh my god, he actually likes the government? He must be one of them. <laughs> you know, like, uh, wait till you guys have the chance to meet, you know, uh, really high-ranking military officials and intelligence people, and not one of them will let you down in, in the sense of how smart they are, how thoughtful they are, and how they rose to those ranks isn't because they're idiots and they're mean people and they want to get rich, <laughs> you know, it's like, it doesn't happen. These guys make very modest salaries and they put their life uh, in harm's way day after day. And uh, it's, it's just, they just don't take time to come over to your living room and explain what the hell's going on because they can't, you know, they're busy. So, okay, um, next question. Uh, from Josh, what is God's all about, and what do secret machines have to do with religion? This is Peter. I think Andrew can answer this. Oh, now he come up. <laughs> well, okay. Well, we, we envision this as a trilogy, so we're trying to approach, really, with an emphasis on the late 20th century and the 21st century, we're trying to approach the history of this phenomenon. But we had to start somewhere, and... For me, the starting place was, as I as I mentioned, cargo cults. I mean, it's ancient Egypt, ancient Sumer, uh, the ancient Mexican and Chinese civilizations, all of these different civilizations, and in Africa and all around the world, I believe there was initial contact. There was, at a certain point in our history, there was the first contact. Whatever it was, whatever, whatever characterization it had, whatever manifestation it had, there was contact. We had homo sapiens on this planet for a few hundred thousand years before the first civilization suddenly started developing all around the world, almost simultaneously. So I'm tracing back to that, and I'm saying, okay, there, let's, let's posit there was contact. What did it look like? And each of these religions, and I'm not talking about trying to decode the pyramids or the Nazca lines or any of the stuff that you see on the cable channels. And so let's forget that, because science may come along and figure this out later. Let's ignore that for a while. Let's look at what the religions themselves actually said in their own texts. What are they describing? What are they talking about? What are they insisting is the truth? Take it at face value. Don't assume that the ancient people were just making shit up, right? There's a, there's a truism if you study religion, and I studied religion, there's, there's a truism that first comes the event, and then comes the myth that explains the event. The myth doesn't show up first something happens that we try to explain and that's what God's is all about we start there and I think you'll find a lot of very revealing material that will make you look at religions in a different way than you ever have before if you start on the premise that there was contact if you start on the premise that as we do that the phenomenon is real that it's absolutely real we're starting from there we're not trying to prove it as Tom said that's been done a hundred times over what we're trying to do is say okay it's real how do we reinterpret that all of our history from then until now, and God's is the first step in doing that. And it's a lot for people to absorb. I mean, obviously religion is very sacred to so many people and guides the way they think, the way they feel, whether you're brought up in it or you chose to join a certain faith on your own. So it's really hard to talk about it all. Um, one of the things I always wanted to make clear, it's I, I'm not the guy that, you know, doesn't think God exists. I just, I, I, I think there is a God. I just and there's only one, someone's right about it, or maybe we're all wrong, and there's this one thing that we're getting wrong, and we're, we're kind of turning other great people into gods, but, it, you know, I, I'm not ever trying to say there isn't a god. I just think that we kind of messed up the message, um, obviously, because there's so many different religions. I mean, if, if no one messed up the message, we would all be believing the same thing. So it's obvious that everyone is splintered off because of different ways of thinking about it. So I'm not anti-religion by any means. I just think that um, all the different civilizations saw something and, are, and, and they're trying to define stuff that's really hard to define. And, um, uh, but it doesn't mean that there isn't some incredible force that creates stars and planets that is, is the battery for our consciousness and our souls are intimately tied to it. I think all that stuff's true, you know? Um, but, so I just wanted to make that clear. So, uh, Okay, so this is from Luke. What is the role of science in all of this? That's really actually an interesting question. You guys scientists? No, I don't know. Yeah. Who want, which one of you want, wants this one? I'm looking at you. Peter, what do you think the role of science is with this stuff? Well, it, I think it's a mistake to divide this down in this way that we've been taught, you know, especially in Western uh, academic circles, that there's science over here and there's religion over there. 
and maybe there's consciousness over there, but we're not too sure about that. Science is, is, is intimately involved with this entire subject, and science is getting stranger and stranger and stranger, in case you haven't noticed. What scientists are doing is discovering different ways of looking at reality, which are challenging and which border on the religious, on the spiritual, and the miraculous. So science is very much part of it. But sometimes when people say science, they really mean technology. And technology is different. Technology is making tools, right? Now, if you think of the natural world, the trees and rocks and the sky and everything else, it's just there. But if you think about the chairs we're sitting on, they were created from those raw materials by humans using consciousness, imagination, creativity, something that's intangible, and they created something tangible. We're the interface between science and religion, between matter and spirituality. We're operating in both worlds. So we have to be cognizant of both science and religion. They're both very much involved with this. In the second book in this Secret Machines trilogy, God's Man and War, man is going to be a lot about science. I, I have this feeling that a lot of religion was created to define stuff that science couldn't at the time. We just lumped it into that category, you know? Right, well, that's why I say we're all a cargo cult. Science and religion at one point were not different. There was never a word for religion until about 500 years ago or so. The word religion did not exist. It was not a separate category of being. If you were an Egyptian in ancient Egypt, you didn't say my religion is Egyptian, right? I'm an Egyptian, therefore there's Optum and Osiris and Isis, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, and your science, the pyramids, were developed and built along religious lines, but it was technology. It was science that built them, but for religious ends. So we look at it as all different categories. But in those days, they didn't. It was all one category. We split it up, especially since the scientific revolutions of, you know, the 17th century and all that. But I think it was never meant to be divided. I think what happened was religion got so you know, contentious, and people were fighting each other and killing each other around the religion. The scientists backed off and said, oh, you know, let's do our own thing privately and see what we can come up with on our own. It's not tainted by all this ideological squabble. You know, it's interesting. If you look at the stories of angels in the Bible, there were these, uh, these beings that glowed. Uh, they would kind of float. Um, they were very powerful. They can talk to you in your mind, or they can... Uh, they, they can do all the things and all the, the magic that the Bible would talk about. Um, you know, it's funny, I just read a document on the CIA website about two hours ago, and it's from 1952, and I was just telling you guys about this, and it describes a landing in Eastern Germany. And it, this, was a, this is a formal CIA write-up on what happened, and you guys can go and read it on CIA's website. And it describes a landing where these two people got out, uh, and they were glowing, and they were floating, and they matched every single description that you see in the Bible. Um, now, you've got to look at all the religions and kind of go, well, what did Joseph Smith talk about when he created Mormonism? Or, or uh, the, the, you look at all of them, they all have those kind of same similarities where it might be the, the glowing entity, or it might be the little ones, the little guys with the big black eyes fit in too, you know? It was interesting. I have this this thing I haven't really told anybody before. I think I've probably told you guys this. I remember a very specific question I asked to a very important person, and I described all these events that have happened over the past 70 years, big important things, and then I described a whole other series of events that happened, but they were kind of opposite. And I remember I asked them all, "Is this the angels and the demons of the Bible?" And all I got back was, "Yes." And then I said, they must not like each other then. Agreed. And that was the end of it, you know? And then about a week later, I got two words back and it said proxy war. And I thought that was really interesting. Um, there's a lot going on. So the idea of religion started because we saw these angels. Well, then we might work our way up and realize, well, no, these are some race. <coughs> that has a force field around themselves and they glow and they float and it and it fucks with your mind and you and you think it's a dream <laughs> but it's not but it's the same things you know so um but maybe through science we'll discover that uh but for thousands of years it was religion um, so it's something to think about i don't have all the answers but i got like 99.9 percent <laughs> um okay 
for Michael, the audiobook was amazing. Will you be doing audiobooks uh, for future Secret Machines or Two Stars books? Yes, we are. And we just uh, did an audiobook. Um, we just did it for the nonfiction, didn't we? Did we? Are we working on it? Here, is that right? Yeah. Thing, about to, okay. We're in the middle of putting the nonfiction into it as an audio book. And for cathedrals, yeah, I mean, look. Yes, the answer is yes, yeah. Um, Secret Machines, I was like 15 CDs or some shit. Yeah. If you're driving to Russia, <laughs> you can listen to all of it. Um, how's the documentary coming along? <laughs> That's a hard question to ask, right? Um, there, it's, it's a tricky, tricky question. I was, uh, I set out to tell a story about how all this came about. Um, and I, that's, it's just some things happen. <laughs> Julian Assange was awesome. He's a really good friend of ours. Okay? Uh, so, what we're going to be doing is changing gears a little bit. Um, there's some stuff that we're not going to talk about. Uh, for a variety of reasons that I can't really get into, but there's still so much to tell. And one thing I really, really believe in is that, you know, you might have heard me say that there's, we're, I'm going to be saying some stuff coming up in the near future. That is going to be a journey worth being included on, on the documentary side of things. And I think a lot of the adventure has just, has just begun to start. So um, don't get uh, sad about the interruption and the idea that the, the big story was how this all came about, I, I think you guys need to prepare for, for what's coming. So.